I had someone during the holidays say, uh, Calvary's just not as friendly as it used to be. Well, that kind of hit me. Now, I understand that was on Christmas Sunday, and everybody had their own agenda to get back home with the family and everything. But I got to thinking, um, you know, the first of the year is a good time to stop and make sure that we are checking our spiritual pulse and kind of get back to basics, Okay. Um, just kind of do a spiritual check of our own hearts and our own attitudes and how we respond to people and how, what we say. So God is asking me to do this series that we are calling Loving Our Community. But Easter is early in April this year, and we have a lot to say, so we may break this series during the Lenten season and then pick it back up. But that sound like a plan to you? Okay, well, I'm glad both of you agree with that. January 12th. 2007 751 in the morning an experiment began sponsored by the Washington Post a young musician takes his position against the wall in the metro station of the Washington DC subway he's wearing jeans a long sleeve t-shirt and a Washington national baseball's cap baseball cap and he opens up his violin case removes the instrument throws a few dollars in the case uh, from his pocket as seed money and he begins playing, and for the next 43 minutes, he, he plays, during that time, he performs six classical pieces flawlessly. During those 43 minutes, 1,097 people went walking by and, and just totally ignored him for the most part, uh, tossing in a total of $32.17 in his violin case. Of that 1,097 people, only seven stopped long enough, more than about 60 seconds, to listen to this performance. And of those seven who lingered, only one recognized the violinist, Joshua Bell. Three days prior, he had filled Boston Symphony Hall, where just adequate tickets sold for $100 apiece. Two weeks later, he would play for standing room only in an audience for Bethesda, in Bethesda, Maryland. Joshua Bell's talents and artistry command an average of $1,000 per minute when performing. But this day in the subway, he barely earned enough money to pay for a cheap pair of shoes. Now, you can't fault the instrument. He was playing a Stradivarius worth $3.5 million. You can't fault the performance. He flawlessly played Johann Sebastian Bach's best work. Yet scarcely anyone noticed the presence of such artistry in this context flanked by a kiosk on one side and a shoeshine stand on the other. I mean, who, who has time to notice beauty and value in the midst of such a hectic, self-absorbed, preoccupied society, right? 
Most of those passerbys cynically wrote off this entertainer as some typical needy dime a dozen musician or someone who needed a few more cents to support his habit or for a place to sleep. But if you think about that, I think you would agree that it has become far, far worse than 2007. We today are living in a cynical, rude, self-consumed world. Would you agree with that? Cynicism is on the rise. Common courtesy is not so common anymore. <laughs> the tone of our society today is more and more an irreverent tone of sarcasm and put down. And, and it's not just a certain age group. It's not a certain, just a racial divide. It's not gender-based. This is a societal epidemic that the church is trying to navigate through. Cynicism, rudeness, self-absorption with our rights seems to be the common attitude of our world and our society today. And rudeness translates into a lack of respect. It seems that respect for other people, respect for property, respect for institutions and law is at an all-time low. Our entertainment, our political leaders, even our music displays disrespect, rudeness, and selfishness, yet... The final sermon preached by Jesus Christ, recorded in Matthew 25, Christ depicted this final scene of a final day of judgment where he painted a portrait of all who will stand before him. All will be held personally accountable for their words and their actions. And the portrait that Jesus painted was one of a shepherd separating the sheep from the goats. You're familiar with that. It's recorded in Matthew 25, verse 31 and following. I want to read it to you. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes, you clothed me. I was sick, and you look after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Jesus Christ was teaching us in this section of scripture that salvation is the work of Christ, but that compassion is the consequence of of salvation amen we also learn in this section of scripture that works of mercy are very often simple deeds i mean clothing the needy visiting the sick feeding the hungry giving a cup of cold water treating others with dignity and respect now it is true that none of us can help everyone but all of us can help someone would you agree with that and when we treat others with respect and compassion, we discover that we are serving Jesus Christ himself. So let's talk about how we show proper respect to one another, okay? By, by definition, rudeness is a lack of respect for others. It reveals that I could care less about you. I'm only thinking about myself. Rudeness says it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks or whether it hurts you or not. I'm going to do what I want to do, period, right? It's been said you can summarize the meaning of rudeness in one simple word, selfishness. Yet our Bible teaches that selfishness is something that can only be transformed by the grace of God. In 1 Corinthians 13, 3, we read, love is not rude. The Phillips paraphrase of that has it this way, love has good manners, okay? 1 Peter 2, 17 tells us, show proper respect to everyone that refers to members of your family you know your spouse your children the jerk you work with at the office no comments from the staff please uh your, your mother-in-law 
your brothers or sisters of a different race, everyone. It even refers to Democrats and Republicans and unbelievers. Everybody, amen? According to God's holy word, we are to respect everyone. Now, the Bible also indicates that God is love, 1 John 4, 16. That love comes from God, 1 John 4, 7. That we are to be imitators of God, Ephesians 5, 1. And that we are to love one another, 1 John 4, 11. And if we do not love one another, then we do not truly love God, 1 John 4, 20 and 21. So if love has good manners and treats everyone with respect, and if we are commanded to respect everyone, let's talk about it, okay? Why should we treat everyone with respect? Well, this series is entitled, as I said, Loving Our Community. And some of you may remember back in 2011, this church produced a movie entitled The Grace Card. Yeah, some of you can't forget it, can you? But we, we produced that movie, okay. And what we originally intended and anticipated as a statement to our specific community has become a statement to our entire society. But as demonstrated in that movie, the awesome power of grace and forgiveness can melt the hardest of hearts and bring about reconciliation and a healing relationships, even to those difficult-to-love type of individuals like Mac McDonald, that character in our movie. I'm I'm sure all of us have a Mac in our lives, probably more than one, right? And, and what we are wanting to do in this sermon series is sort of flesh out some of the mandates of Scripture that teach us how to live with one another so that grace is the rule of the day, not cynicism, not rudeness, not disrespect. So today we're going to talk about showing respect to one another, and we're going to, to look not only how to offer this grace, but how to receive it as well. So let me begin by setting this foundation. Respect is one of the basic needs of life. Would you agree with that? Everyone needs to be and wants to be respected. Amen? Because we all want to treat people with dignity and honor and we want to treat others like they would treat us right not only that but the bible makes it very clear that respect is one of those values that a stable family is built on a stable life is built on it's even a framework for a civilized society if there's no respect among people for rights or for responsibilities or for each other then the civilization decays right so today we're going to look at how do you give and how do you get respect because they're the same thing. The way you get respect is the same way you give respect and they, they go together, okay? But before we look at that, let me just quickly give to you four reasons why the Bible teaches that you should treat everyone with respect regardless of their lifestyle, regardless of their decisions, regardless of their behavior and, and their beliefs, regardless of their race or political affiliation. The Bible says that every person should be treated Treated with respect for four reasons. Letter A, because God created everybody. Psalm 8 5 says, You, God, made man inferior to yourself. You crown him with glory and honor. Everybody is created by God, and God doesn't make any junk, right? There are no worthless people. Amen? Now, there are people who may do worthless things or wrong things, but but, but even the despicable, unlovely riffraff of society are valued by God. You see, we, we tend to be polite and kind to people that we consider to be more important than us, and we think that if, if they can help better ourselves, we ought to be nice to them. We were looking at the ladder of social standing, you know, but we tend to be rude to people that we believe are below our social status or those who we perceive are attempting to use us to better themselves. Like Joshua Bell in the subway station, Washington, D.C. I, I wonder how many of us would have just walked right by him. But you see, it, what a vicious cycle of hypocrisy that can create, right? God says, listen, I created all mankind. And even the most unlovable person is loved by God. Do you agree with that? Okay, thank you for both of you. Let her be because Jesus Christ died for everyone. The Bible says God paid a ransom to save you. He paid you for you with the precious lifeblood of Jesus Christ. Now, I may not think much of somebody, but Almighty God does, right? In fact, he says they are worth dying for. The words the, 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 and the cross of Calvary shows 
how much people matter to God. Christ died for people who rejected him, disobeyed him, scorned him. Christ still died for them because God considers them to be people of value and worth. That's why Matthew 25, 40, Jesus said, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers of mine, you did for me. Therefore, we see the importance and the value that, that our loving God placed on everyone, okay? The third reason that we should show respect to everybody, this letter C, it authenticates that I'm a child of God. You see, the Bible says God is love. And if I know God, then I'm going to fill my life with love. 1 John 4, 8 says it this way. Uh, if a person is not loving and kind, it shows he doesn't know God, for God is love. And love always treats people with respect. Now think about it. Jesus ministered in a culture that was plagued with racism, right? We've talked about that before, how he crossed cultural and racial lines. He spoke with and ministered to the woman at the well in Samaria. But even during the three years of his public ministry, the Jews and the Gentiles had a lot of racial hostility going on, okay? But Christ modeled that all men were precious in his sight. For example, Matthew 15, a Canaanite woman came to Jesus. We learn her ancestry was Gentile. And at this point in history, Jews considered Gentiles to be unclean, okay? But she approaches Jesus because her daughter is dying and her prayer request is urgent. She recognized that Jesus could heal her daughter. And aware of this racial divide, Jesus says to her, I was sent to only help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. This Canaanite woman responds, that's true, Lord, but even the dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. While Jesus, through his response, acknowledged the racial divide, his position was clear, his actions spoke much louder than his words because he healed the, wo the woman's daughter, right? And in doing this, he made his position clear and his actions model for us what we in the church of Jesus Christ should make clear by our word and deed. Jesus was more concerned about bringing everyone into the fold of God than shutting anyone out. Amen? And after Pentecost, Peter was taught the same lesson with the household of Cornelius. And, and, and the church of Jesus Christ has been taught by scripture and by example and by mandate of our Lord himself. Christ dies for everyone. And this is his body, his bride, the church. We should be treating all men with dignity, respect, and compassion. If you look at the life of Christ, he treated even his enemies with respect. Even those who wanted to kill him. He wasn't rude to them. He was, he was not demeaning of them, but he treated even the people who were trying to put him to death with respect. So, if I am filled with Jesus Christ's love and the spirit of God's love is living in me, then I'm going to treat other people the way that Jesus did. Amen? I'm going to treat everyone with value and dignity. Now, as your pastor, let me just say this. The number one test of your faith is with your relationships especially those in your own home. Because you see, it's not so much what you say you believe that matters as much as how that belief comes out in your behavior. The number one test of my faith is in my relationships, which is why we're doing this series, because one of the things we'll be judged for at the judgment is how we treated other people. And I believe that at the top of that list is how you treated other people in your own family and in the family of God, his church. You know, we can get into debates over doctrinal issues, and you can have all your beliefs right. But if you're rude, you're still wrong. Do you understand that? I mean, think about this. Even when people were living in sin, Jesus corrected them. He held them accountable in love. Now, he was no milk toast. He exercised, exercised firmness and strength. Just like he did with the woman caught in adultery. He loved her. He rebuked the sin in her life. He forgave her. And then he told her to go and sin no more, right? But he did so with such great gentleness and care because the Bible clearly teaches us that love is not rude. And letter D, because I will reap what I sow. Now, this is the law of the harvest, okay? This is that old adage, whatever goes around comes around, right? This is part of the very fabric of the universe. I mean, God just set it up that way that whatever a man sows, he will also reap. If you want to be respected, it's real simple. 
treat other people with respect. Amen? If you want to be treated with value and dignity, it's real clear. Treat other people with value and dignity. If you want people to smile at you, smile at them. Okay? This is just how God made the universe. Whatever you give out, you're going to get back. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 7, a man's harvest in life will depend entirely on what he sows. And another verse, you may just want to write this one down. This verse is Proverbs eleven seventeen. God says, you do yourself a favor when you are kind. Okay? In other words, it never pays to be rude, right? I, I've heard it said that great people are ordinary people who make other people feel great. And the most respected people are those who are the most respectful people. They show kindness and respect to other people. They make others feel good about themselves. They receive that then back in life tenfold because you reap what you sow, okay? Okay, let's get practical about and talk about some nuts and bolts of showing proper respect to one another. This is just kind of first of the year as we go into this new year. Let's make sure outreach and compassion is a part of who we are, okay? And in this world that's full of rudeness and disrespect, in a city here in Memphis that struggle with racism and even to this day carries some deep painful wounds in that regard, how can I show respect to others in a very practical way? Let me give you five very practical ways to do this, very easy things that we can all practice in our own lives in this church as we seek to love our community. And as we've said before, part of truly loving people is the willingness to hold them accountable because you need friends that will tell you the truth, right? So we better talk about how to do that respectfully with love, okay? Letter A, or number one, when I speak to other people, I need to be tactful, not just truthful. How many want to say amen to that one? Because the primary way that we show respect is through our words, okay? Look at this verse with me, please, Proverbs 15, 33. What a joy it is to find just the right word for just the right occasion <laughs> and proverbs 15 4 says would you read this out loud with me let's read this kind words bring life but cruel words crush your spirit now what he's talking about here is tactfulness and tactfulness is a quality we don't hear much about today but it's about watching how you say what you say okay I mean, think about this. Have you not discovered that the way you say something determines how well it will be received? Sure. You can say something in different ways, and it will either be rejected or accepted. And even the inflection of your voice can totally change the way a word is received. The simple tone of your voice can disarm a tense situation. And the Bible teaches that if you want to get along with others, the secret is tactfulness. It's like greasing the wheel of relationships it reduces friction it makes things go better it's the key to a happy home to a strong marriage it's the key to strong friendships or relationships learning how to be truthful and tactful at the same time is an absolute essential ingredient to being respectful if you say things in a kind way you don't have to eat your words so often okay so let me simply remind you none of us are so special that we can afford to treat others with any sense of arrogance or disrespectful rudeness, right? The Bible teaches in Ephesians 4 about speaking the truth in love. And in Proverbs 15, 4, we read, Kind words bring life, but cruel words crush your spirit. So stick with me here. God wants you to tell the truth. The Bible teaches us not to speak falsehood. But please catch this. We are to say it in a respectful and loving way, right? And now, now listen, oftentimes the truth hurts. And it's tactfulness and respect that removes the sting of that hurt to where we can honestly face the reality, someone can face the reality of their circumstances and still feel self-respect and self-esteem. So when you start to hold someone accountable in love, you need to stop and ask yourself, why am I going to say this? Am I going to say this to build them up or tear them down? Am I going to say this to make a point that, we'll, that I'll get credit for? Or am I going to say this to find some common ground? Am I going to say this to protect someone's dignity? Or am I going to try to punish them for making a mistake or a poor judgment call? Many times we think that we are justifiably being candid and bold-faced honest. In actuality, we're simply spouting off our anger and we're venting our own self-justification. 
And there's no value in that. There's not, that's nothing to be proud of. There are many Christians who believe that, that just because they're telling the truth, they can ignore common courtesy. Absolutely not. Because oftentimes in the church of Jesus Christ, that comes off as a holier-than-thou attitude or self-righteousness or even worse, a mean-spirited, condescending arrogance that is not lovely at all, that does not reflect the image of Christ. And the Bible teaches us to be tactful, not just truthful, okay? Letter B, when I'm being served by someone, I need to be understanding, not demanding. You know, one of the greatest tests of your character is how you treat other people when they serve you. And I'm talking here about waitresses and waiters. I'm talking about uh, other employees or clerks. I'm talking about spiritual leaders or friends who serve you in love. I'm talking about your spouse or your parents or your family, right? Are you understanding or are you demanding? Please listen to me. You bear the image of Christ 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Amen? Jesus said it like this in Luke 6, 31, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, you know that's the golden rule. But you see, as one man put it, Eric Hoffner, rudeness is a weak man's imitation of strength. It takes absolutely no intelligence at all to be rude or disrespectful. On the other hand, it takes great character and great maturity and great strength to be understanding and not demanding of people, especially under stressful circumstances. Because, you see, the secret of great service is to treat people the way that you would like to be treated. Jesus said in Mark 9, 35, if you want to be first, you must be last. If you want to be great, you must be the servant of all. So you treat people with respect and understand, be understanding, not demanding. And remember, please, the training ground for all that we're talking about this, the best training grounds in the home. More marriages and homes are torn apart by rudeness and disrespect and selfishness and ridicule than we know how to count. This next verse is a wealth of wisdom for us. Look at Proverbs 16, 21. A wise, mature person is known for his or her understanding. The more pleasant their words, the more persuasive they are. So practice this at home and exercise it in public, okay? Letter C. When you meet people you disagree with, which is often, be kind and not critical. Now, listen, as a Christian believer in this society, there are many things that I totally disagree with. I'm sure that's true for you as well. Because if you're a person that's really trying to live according to God's will and you're trying to follow his word and you read in the Bible, these things are wrong, definitely, and these things are definitely right. And if you do what's right, God places his blessings on you. If you do what you, what's wrong, you wind up with all kinds of problems. So as a believer in Christ, there are many things in my society, our society today, that I absolutely abhor. They make me sick. There are things I violently disagree with, but how am I supposed to react to these people? When somebody works with me or perhaps is my neighbor, and maybe they happen to be a relative and they have a lifestyle choice or an attitude or behavior I disagree with, and in fact, I even know beyond a shadow of a doubt it's wrong, how am I supposed to relate to those people? Well, we need to remember two things, okay? Please hear me on this, okay? I need to remember that ultimately every person will individually be held accountable by God. Amen? Every person will one day give an account to God. We just read that of their own actions, attitudes, behavior, choices of life. I'm going to some to I'm have to do that someday, and so will you, okay? So one day God is going to settle the score. I need to remember that. But the second thing I need to remember is I'm not God. So those people are not accountable to me, and they're not ultimately accountable to you. Please listen carefully to what I say, okay? It's not my calling to go around acting like a religious policeman to hold accountable those who are not believers and make them act like they are believers. In fact, the scripture teaches that people cannot act the way that God wants them to act. They cannot live a life that's pleasing to God until they get God in their life, right? Because when they ask God into their life, he gives them the power to change. However, and here's where you're supposed to be listening very carefully. It's a different principle that takes effect when a person who is living in error calls himself or herself a believer. 
When a person who professes to be a child of God is living in sin, and it's the responsibility of that brother or sister in the Lord to hold them accountable in love, okay? Paul says, 1 Corinthians 5, 12, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? But as I've always said, you must take the Bible holistically, okay? And the Bible also says in Hebrews 10, 30, the Lord will judge his people. Now, I know that kind of sounds like double talk, but here's the deal. In 1 Corinthians chapters 3 and 5, Paul talks about how seriously and how severely God deals with those who say that they are a child of God and they profess to be a believer, but they continue to live in sin and ignore the mandates of God. And in love for our brothers and sisters, we are to hold them accountable in love in an effort to spare them such severe judgment and or punishment because Jesus Christ wants his bride, the church, to be a spotless bride. Amen? But it must be done in great humility and deep love because at the same time, I am called to be a witness, not a warden. Amen? Now, I realize there's a huge difference between being a witness and taking a stand for Christ, being a wimp and doing nothing, and thereby adding to the problem, letting evil prosper. But please notice this next verse, Romans 14, 12, and 13. Each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on each other. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block in another's way. So please remember what I've taught you before. Telling the truth is not being judgmental. If I tell you don't go out on Houston Levy Road and play in the middle lane because you, they drive crazy out there, you're going to get run over. That's not being judgmental. That's telling the truth, right? If I tell a young woman who's pregnant, don't do drugs and drink alcohol because it's hurting your unborn child, that's not being judgmental, that's telling the truth. If I tell people you need to live by the moral laws of God, if you don't, it will cause hurtful consequences to your life. It's not being judgmental, it's telling the truth. But we are dealing with a community, we are dealing with relationships, and we need to have close relationships of love close enough for us to hold them accountable to, to tell them the truth and they're willing to let us do that so it starts with relationship what is judgmental please hear me is when you take the truth you beat people over the head with it and then you enjoy it because it makes you feel morally superior no 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 you tell the truth to people to help them, not to change, to change them, to try to develop them, not to try to harm them, put them down, or cause them to feel bad. And sometimes, like I said, the truth does make someone feel bad. It's not your fault for telling me that. You simply say it in love and with tactfulness, and you allow the truth to wake up their heart to hear it, okay? So I guess what I'm saying is you can disagree with someone without being disagreeable. You don't have to devastate everyone you disagree with simply because they're not doing what is right, okay? Because you get more flies with honey than with salt, amen? So again, I say you can be right about something, but if you don't talk about that in love, you're wrong. Because this section of scripture will be, that we'll be studying, 1 Corinthians 13, says very clearly, if you don't have love, you're like a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And honestly, some of the rudest people I've ever met were overzealous Christians who were so committed to the truth, but who had no love for people. And sometimes we need to just get back to basics and remember that we are to exemplify and hold up a different standard in our culture because we are children of the Most High God. Amen? So please remember, you can, you can be right about an issue, but if you're rude about it, you're still wrong. Okay? Because the Bible does not say the greatest of these is to be doctrinally correct. The Bible says the greatest of these is love. So catch this. If we're not treating others with dignity and love, we're not treating others with respect, we're not pleasing to God. And finally, letter... No, not finally. I'm almost done. Letter D. <laughs> when you share your faith with people, do it while showing proper respect. Okay? Colossians 4, 5, and 6 says, Be tactful with those who are not Christians... Talk to them agreeably with favor and with, with a favor of wit and try to fit your answers to the needs of each one. And First Peter tells us, if anybody asks you why you believe as you do, be ready to tell him or her and do it with a gentle and respectful way. What's that verse telling us? You don't argue people into heaven. 
That's right. We can recognize that Jesus, Jesus accepts us just as we are, and then he works to transform us into the image of God. We need to love people as they are while at the same time lovingly encouraging them to become all God wants them to be, right? But you don't argue people into heaven. God says to each of us, I want your life to shine. I just don't want you to be a blowtorch. Okay? So share your faith by showing proper respect. And finally, letter E, when people are rude to you, respond politely. In other words, don't, don't retaliate by being rude back. That only adds fuel to the fire because the Bible teaches, Romans 12, do not pay, repay evil for evil, overcome evil with good. Anytime you treat another individual with respect, dignity, and honor, I believe God is pleased. So I just want to encourage you we live in a generation that is very me-oriented. And in this narcissistic society, people are simply consumed with themselves, their rights, their pleasures. They're all looking out for number one. And as stresses rise and as pressures increase, as patience is stretched, our society is becoming more and more known for its rudeness and self-absorbed preoccupation. And I just encourage you to be people of grace who know how to play the grace card like we talked about in our movie so that when you face the judgment bar of God one day, you will be rewarded for the gracious, loving, respectful, and kind way you treated your fellow man regardless of gender, age, socioeconomic background, race, or ethnicity. I want Calvary Church to be the most polite, courteous family church in our community, okay? When people come to our church, I want them to say, wow, they really love people there. Doesn't matter what you wear, what you look like, doesn't matter what the color of your skin is, doesn't matter what your social status or background is, they are friendly and genuinely glad to see you. That church really loves God and really loves his children as well. That's the church Christ died for us to be. Amen. So help us, won't you, as we seek to love our community. Stick with me in this series. Let's, let's pray, shall we? Our gracious Heavenly Father, your word tells us that there sometimes needs to be some oil in our transactions with relationships. And the oil that we need to lubricate those relationships with is grace. I pray that we would be a people of grace. I pray that we would be a people who love others so genuinely that it's obvious and the reputation precedes us. And I pray, dear Father, as we look back on your word, what it teaches us in dealing with relationships through this series, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that we would gather with receptive hearts to hear what your word is saying to us today. We love you. We thank you. We pray for our city this week that you would protect and that you would calm the, the anger and the nerves and that the truth would be found and justice would be carried out. Protect our first responders, Father. Go before us as a people that we may glorify you. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray and all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Pastor Tom is going to close us out. Thank you, Pastor, for uh, reminding us of who we are to be in Christ. It's a good New Year's reminder. I guess it ha helps us to uh, make a news New Year's resolution that is more than just a January to-do uh, to list. <laughs> Speaking of reminders, the first two Sundays in February, we will be having church elections for our church board and some of our ministry leaders. First two Sundays in February. Uh, be aware of that, be in prayer about it as well, uh, so that uh, uh, we can carry this off effectively. Uh, one of the things you might uh, be interested in, some of, some of you may like uh, bluegrass music, if you do. Next Sunday at 4.30 p.m., at the Cowboy Church. A fellow by the name of Jeff Talent is going to be there who is a bluegrass musician and singer. Uh, be there <laughs> and enjoy that time together with his uh, banjo picking and uh, enjoy the 
bluegrass music. Smile at somebody this week. Um, it may help to lift somebody's day. Otherwise, they may just wonder what the world you're up to. You're dismissed. Thank you. <laughs>